What's up everybody? Welcome to episode 2 of the Quest for Pixels Gamer Chat. This week's guest is amazing. We've got Craig Harris who is best known from IGN. He was an editor over there. He was the first host of the NBC podcast or originally known as the Weekend Review. I'm excited for you guys to hear this. I guess I'll give you a little update on the state of the show. So I know that I haven't got as many episodes out as I wanted to, but I really want to get, you know, quality guests for the show, somebody interesting. So I hope you guys are okay with that. Going forward, it'll probably be, you know, maybe every two weeks, um, at least once a month. But like I said, I want to get good guests, interesting people. I'm really excited for this one. Uh, it was an amazing chat. And I hope you guys really enjoy it. So without further ado, let's get into the chat with Mr. Cranky Craig Harris. This is awesome getting to talk to you because <laughs> like <laughs> I've known you since like 2004 I think is like the first time like when I started getting into IGN. So that's the that's the nice way of saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I guess like the first question I like to ask um, is like how did you get into gaming? Like do you remember like how you were introduced to it? How did I get into gaming? Yeah. Wow. Uh, you mean in terms of just like, uh, just as a hobby or in yeah. the, the, the career? Um, I guess like, so first, like, um, like your first experience with it and like oh. how it like became a hobby. Sure. I mean, like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember the, uh, um, do you remember Malibu Grand Prix? Maybe not. You, you might be out of that generation. Uh, there was a, there was a, a place called Malibu Grand Prix. Um, and it was essentially like a giant arcade with a with a uh, what do you call it a, a go kart track. Mm -hmm. um, we had one of those in our. Um, it, I lived in South Jersey, and we had one uh, near our house, and that was kind of the first place um, I got a chance to play some like arcade games, and like I was hooked as soon as that happened. Right? I mean, you know, I had played pinball with my dad, you know, like the bowling alleys and stuff like that. But you know, arcade machines. Like in terms of video arcade machines, that was like kind of the first real. Oh my god, there's a ton of arcade games to play, and um, and I was only uh, probably around so uh, seven when we went to uh, my first uh, my trip to uh, uh, Malibu Grand Prix, and since that that's when my dad took me there, and then every time we would drive at least near where my dad would make that left turn. So that we would go to Malibu Grand Prix, but we wouldn't go. All, my dad wasn't really big, big into video games, but he would take me every once in a while to a trip as a treat. Um, but that was kind of it, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of got me hooked. Um, and then a friend of mine got uh, uh, just randomly uh, in third grade. He got an Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and we we played that. Um, and that's what I wanted for Christmas that year. Um, and uh, and my parents for for Christmas uh, got me uh, an Atari Twenty Six Hundred. I think it was in. I think that was in 1980, uh, and that was my first my first video game home system. And then you know, like that that's kind of it, right? It's like that that's where I, you know, you know, you play, you know, pa you know, Pitfall, Pac Man, you know, uh, uh, you know, Space Invaders, all that stuff. Um, and then uh, uh, when that finally broke on me, I you know I had to upgrade the system to something, mm -hmm. and um, I, I kind of opted into uh, an Atari seventy eight hundred because I had you know my parents wouldn't buy me this. That was the last system they bought me was the Atari twenty six hundred. If I wanted any more video games, I had to buy them myself. Yeah, and uh, and so like I used my paper root money and bought a seventy eight hundred, which was like essentially the upgrade of this twenty six hundred is kind of the backward compatible. You know, you could play your old your old games on this thing, but it also played newer games. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. You know, this was before the internet, so you kind of couldn't do your your real research on like, you know, uh, what the industry is doing because this was you know this is just after the video game crash. And, but like me being, uh, you know, what uh, when did that come out? So it was 83, 82, 83, So I was eleven. Um, you know, uh, it. You don't know that the, the video game crash is happening, right? You're not you're not into the current events around you know in that age, um, but yeah, the video game crash was happening. Atari was not doing so well, but I got the system, 
uh, and uh, and no games really came out for it. And the, the games that were coming out for it were all these really old arcade games like you know Joust and Robotron, and and they were kind of aid, they were kind of dated by the time the the, the seven eight hundred came out. Um, and then wouldn't you know it, like probably about a month after I bought the seven eight hundred, the NES like started their uh, test market on the East Coast. Yeah. And uh, and the commercial started playing, and then I was like, "Oh, I backed the wrong horse." <laughs> oh God! And so like I couldn't I couldn't you know just buy a uh, NES like I, I had a paper route right mm-hmm. that, that's all the money I could have is for my video games, and so I had to kind of op- you know all my games had to be purchased on the seventy eight hundred. Luckily, in high school, uh, one of my uh, well friends back then I, I don't know him anymore, but he he was basically like, "I have a NES, but I don't want it anymore." Uh, yeah. And I'll sell it to you for cheap. And I was like, okay, cool. And so, <laughs> I, that, and I got it. I got it from him uh, around the time that uh, Super Mario Two uh, came out. And I remember that. I remember that because um, it was when the issue, the and the, the the Nintendo Power issue came out with the with the with the clay uh, Mario cover. Yep. I don't know if you remember that, but yeah, that was like the, so. Like I got the system around the time that that issue came out. So um, that's. So that's kind of like when I I got into the Nintendo, um, and then uh, like around that time, um, I you know was still working. You know, I wasn't doing paper routes. I was I was doing you know I was at I was working at like Roy Rogers fast food. But then like the uh, yeah, I would go to the mall all the time because the like, arcades were there and all that stuff. But they also had a Babbage's, mm-hmm. um, and so like uh, I was like you know what I want to work here. Like this is video games and there's you know computer games here, but there's also NES and. Um, the, the Turbo Graphics had just come out, and like I, I kind of want to work here in retail, uh, you know, just selling. You know, uh, it was I was 15 at the time, and so like I got hired part time at Babbage's, and eventually that kind of um, expanded when I went to college to to full time manager. Um, and then uh, the the thing about the Babbage's, which was awesome, was uh, you could um, check out games. That was one of the things I had a checkout policy. That was kind of like one of the perks of working at Babbage's was like you could, um, if we had two copies of a specific game, you could say, you know, I'm going to sign this game out, bring it back the next time I'm working. And oh, that's, that's awesome. kind of, that. yeah, it's kind of like a customer service, right? It's like you're learning about the games and you're going to tell the customers whether this game is good or bad. Mm-hmm. And and that kind of got me into uh, like the idea of reviewing games. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, that you would... I, you know, I would, I enjoy talking about video games, but it's like, you know, maybe I should, you know, like write down a review and put it on a, on a, on a, on a three by five card so that when someone asks about it, they can actually pull that up. So that kind of honed my, yeah, my, honed my, cool. my, my, my writing skills, you know, uh, and I, you know, like when I was in, in high school and college, everyone thought that I was a, a really good writer, um, but I didn't really think much of it. And then, uh, but, but yeah, so that kind of honed my skills and, and kind of the, the, the critical thinking, the, 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 qualitative analysis or whatever you want to call it um and uh and so that's kind of where I, you know it's that's where it kind of started when i wanted to actually do this whole game review thing and then of course you know babbage's started carrying the magazines and so like on our downtime we would just open up one of the magazines and start reading them you know next generation uh mm-hmm. was like the you know the, the big magazine i was like oh my god this, this magazine is amazing but you know it was also um uh you know electronic gaming monthly uh game fan um, what was the other ones? Uh, Ultra Game Players. Uh, I'm trying to think of other magazines that we would read, you know, just on our downtime. But uh, Next Generation had a had an ad for uh, they were looking for editors, and uh, you know, for you know Next Generation. I'm like, oh, I totally, you know, that would be great if uh, you know, like I worked for them. So I would send the, I sent them my resume and all that stuff. But I don't think I, that anything happened there. But then. Um, that's when like the internet started coming around, mm-hmm. um, and you know you would, you know it, there was always the internet. You went you went on Usenet groups to kind of like, chat about uh, video games and all that stuff. But you know when the web pages started coming out, um, you know with Netscape uh, Navigator, um, you can actually like you know navigate to these websites. And uh, uh, so Next Generation had an online, uh, you know their 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 site. Where you could actually get uh, daily news, and then one of the one, uh, one day they actually posted a a, a news article. They're looking for um, writers for something new called the Imagine Games Network. So they had, uh, you know, uh, they had an N sixty four site, they had a a Saturn site, a PlayStation site, and then you know Next Generation Magazine had their online site, and I think Ultra Game Players also had their online thing. 
And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to send him my resume again. And so uh, I did that. And then I got a phone call, uh, had an interview. And then uh, I had another interview, another second phone call. Uh, and then uh, they hired me on the phone. And I, this was interesting because like, they were already in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But I was, in, I was in South Jersey. So like I got hired on the phone. I said, okay, when can you, when can you come out? I'm like, uh, I'm a, uh, so like, so I, I literally like, okay, I can come out in three weeks. And so I packed up my car and, you know, drove the four or five days to across country to San Francisco, which I've never been to the West coast. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that's kind of like where I started my real career in, in video games. So, you know, like, I mean, you know, obviously I started at, you know, in retail, but in, in yeah. terms of actually like, you know, making a, uh, you know, break in the in the industry. I think that was my real break was moving out to San Francisco in the Bay Area. Yeah, and 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 working for Imagine Games Network, which became IGN. Mm -hmm. So, so throughout uh, throughout your whole, <clears throat> I mean, your whole life, like, what would you say your your uh, like favorite game or series is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, I would never, I wouldn't say it's the best game, but I would say the last. The last game that I I felt really passionately, I was like, oh my god, I I can't I, I you know I'm consuming everything about this game, you know, reading magazines and seeing the videos and stuff like that. I th I'd say um, was Star Fox on the Super Nintendo. Yeah. Uh, again, again, I'm not saying it's the best game ever made, but it certainly like spoke to me. It was like the first real 3D game. Mm -hmm. um, it had really cool characters and like a, a, a but it was also like a, a 3D game on the on the 16-bit system and and uh, and so like like when they first announced it, I was reading Electronic Gaming Monthly. I'm like, oh my god, this looks really cool. And then I saw it in motion. I'm like, oh my god, this looks really cool. <laughs> and um, because obviously like when the, the like, 3D games were still kind of um, on the PC. Yeah. And they were, you know, and, and in the arcades, I was playing Hard Drive and, and, and Stun Runner, and those that's kind of the, the flat shaded polygon look that they were going for in Star Fox. So it was like, I love those games in the arcade, and they're actually bringing something like that to, to the Super Nintendo, and so I can't wait for this. And, you know, and it, it didn't let me down. Like, when it came out, it's still an amazing game, and, like, it had a great soundtrack and um, really intense action, and, yeah, sure, the frame rate kind of sucks nowadays, but, like, back then, it, oh, yeah. the, the, the standards were, were really, really different. And so, like, yeah, so I would say, like, Star Fox is probably, to me, uh, my, the most impactful uh, uh, game. Now, franchise, not so much, right? Because mm -hmm. um, it never kind of lived up to its original release. Like, yeah. uh, you know, the, 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 so it was always the Super Nintendo game that, you know, is near, near and dear to my heart. When uh, Super, uh, when, when uh, Star Fox 64 was coming out for N64, I was really excited for it. But when it came out, it kind of, I mean, it was good, but like the soundtrack was changed. It was a different composer. Didn't have that same kind of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and yeah, like you know, other other games in the series just you know just aren't as good as how the first Star Fox came out. So you know, the you know, Star Fox Assault on uh, what GameCube and um, I, I did like Star Fox Adventures, but mm -hmm. that what didn't start out as a Star Fox game, so it didn't really feel too much like a Star Fox game. Um, and you know, Star Fox uh, DS was was good, but not great. And uh, you know, Star Fox Zero has its moments, but uh, yeah. you know, it, it it had you know, like if you got rid of that whole dual dual screen thing, I think it would it would have been a better design. But um, it's good. But yeah, so Star Fox as a game on Super Nintendo, probably my biggest. But yeah, not the franchise. My franchise probably Mario. Yeah, just Mario in general. Just like all, all the platforming Mario games are are. Probably the my favorite go to is because honestly, like um, as much as I like every style of video games, like you know, like I I, I tend to resonate towards more of the um, not not giant experiences, just uh, like you know, like the, the Mario's always been like, oh, you play level one one and one two one three, and it's like, and then you can stop and take a break if you want to, but it's like it's not this giant broad you know, 100-hour experience. It's kind of this short, concise, arcade-like experience. And that's kind of the what I got into video games in the first place, right? The yep. arcade, right? You put a quarter in, you play for three minutes, you're done. You move on to the next game. And it's kind of like those are the kind of games I like. Um, so so Mario really kind of uh, sits with me as my favorite franchise. Nice. Yeah, and, like, I can agree with that. Like, Super Nintendo was my, was my first system, and Super Mario World was... 
uh, like everything to me <laughs> and <laughs> and i like that game is what like really shaped my interest in video games so going back to the like you know the platformers and stuff like that the short experience that you don't have to like totally invest yourself like i still like you know like a lot of the rpgs and stuff like that but i've yeah. never been a huge story buff like i like a game that i can pick up and play and i think sure. that was really the super nintendo vibe so um nice cool so how about ign like yeah. What was that like? Like, what was the beginning? Like, what was the beginning of IGN like? Oh it's man, that was an interesting the... story. Well, I mean, it's not, I don't know about an interesting story, but certainly <laughs> like, um, it started. You know, so like, basically, magazines were the thing back then, right? Yep. And so, uh, when you when you want to write about video games, like you're writing for for magazines, but those the, their lead times are like you know three months, right? So so they'll so they, they work with publishers and publishers send send as as close to a final game to the magazine so they can play it and so they can ships so that by the time the magazine comes out, the magazine is being released around the same time as the game. Mm -hmm. But that changed with the with online, right? Yep. And and a lot of times, like so, we had to work with the same. Uh, PR people uh, to get copies of the games uh, to play for review or preview, uh, you know, that the magazine, uh, you know, people are, are, are working with, right? And so when we're calling, it's like, hey, do you have a copy of X or Y or whatever that we can preview or review? And they're like, didn't we just send you one over at Next Generation? And it's like, no, 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 we need it for, for, for the N64 site so that we can write about it. They're like, oh, well, we're not ready for any sort of news or anything like that because, you know, it, it, we gave it to magazines so that, you know, the news can come out three months later. Mm -hmm. You know, like, we, you know, so so they didn't, they, they, they you know, we were doing instantaneous stuff. We're, we're getting the news out as quickly as possible, you know, like, you know, reviewing a game and then putting it up in a day. Um, that, that was unheard of, yeah. you know, when, when the magazines were coming out. And so, but then, of course, it was also like when we were calling for, you know, for news or, or previews or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, hi, hi I'm Craig. I'm, I'm the editor for, uh, you know, Saturn World. And they're like, what, who? Yeah, oh yeah, IGN. And they're like, huh, what? And so, yeah, so we started, you know, when no one knew who we were. Um, yeah. Other, you know, so we would have to say, oh, we're the, the online component of the magazines you already work with. And so that's kind of how we had to make that introduction. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult. Um, so, you know, the, we, were, we were, you know, starting in the early days, um, you know where 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 PR was just not ready for us. Yeah. Um, and we couldn't just go to like next generation. Hey, can we borrow the copy of this and write about it? Because it was given to them for their like you know it might be April and it's for their June or whatever. So we can't even touch. They won't even let us look at the game that they're working on because you know that might give them the, you know like we might seal their scoop for their magazine. So they wouldn't you know even though we're part of the same <laughs> company. Yeah, you know, the same we're the same media. Company. They just wouldn't let us. I mean, they, for the most part, they 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 ease their you know like oh yeah, you can totally look at it. We we trust you. You're not going to put it up online. I get it. Um, but in the early days, like no, you you can't see this. You can't look at it. But uh, um, I guess a uh, uh, you know a good story would be my first year there. Uh, we you know the budgets were very small for online mm -hmm. that we could they couldn't even afford to send the entire team to to E3, and I think, no, I, well, actually, the first year that IGN started, I think E3 was at uh, Atlanta. I, I'm trying to remember if it was, that was the first year they were, so it was 90, 97, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was the Atlanta one. I could be, I could be incorrect, but we didn't get a chance to, because uh, I started in April of 97, uh, E3 is around the June time frame. So basically the idea was, um, you know, they only sent a, a basically a skeleton crew down to E3, and then they had to, you know, do what the, they do their thing down in E3, and then send back the stories through email. When then, and then we would take those stories and then put them in the in in our content management system. It was a very slow and tedious process. But the problem was, like, they would be out on the show floor, and then they wouldn't do anything, or they, you know, they would be seeing the games, and then they would come back at the end of the night and then start sending stories at around eight o'clock, nine o'clock. And so we basically were staying overnight um, in the office, getting emails, um, and we pretty much just had to like sleep under our desks, waiting for the stories to come in. And uh, and we were using old Macs at the time, so like I still remember we were using the email program Eudora, 
Mm-hmm. And there was a specific sound effect when when emails would come in, and that's just that haunts me to this day <laughs> because like that would that would mean oh works you know like wake up get that story up whatever you know like you know there even though there's only a few thousand people you know wanting this this information there's mm-hmm. still people wanting this information so we got to get it out there so yeah that, that was the early days um, luckily like um, after it left Atlanta I think we still had one more year in Atlanta luckily the the inform- you know the the way we were doing the work that first year, um, we took that knowledge and kind of crafted an easier way of getting E3 stories up yeah. um, for the next year. Um, but then luckily it came back to LA, E3. And then since it's on the, our coast, we don't have to fly people. And so we could actually drive down there and, and get a hotel and, and, and have the entire staff there. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, that was great. So, yeah. Cool. So I have, I guess, I think it would still be part of the early years, but, uh, I remember on the podcast on MVC when you were talking about um, Super Smash Bros. Yeah. So, what's that whole story like? Because didn't you well, guys kind of like influence Super Smash Bros. ending up over here? I like to think so. Um, I, I so basically we uh, and maybe you know it, we could be fabricating this entire story, <laughs> but uh, to be. To be honest, it's like basically we, we imported the game, and so obviously around the time that Smash Brothers came out in Japan, mm-hmm. the only way you would have known about it was through like Famitsu, the magazine yeah. Weekly Famitsu. If you, you know, so we would, um, and you couldn't even import the you know through mail order. We would actually go down to uh, a place, a local place in the Bay Area. It was called Network Video, and so they would have the uh, Weekly Famitsu magazines, and then we would see it. And like, oh, we should totally import this. And so, Network Video also did imports. Uh, so we imported the, the 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 Japanese version of the N64 game when it was when it was coming out. And we we fell in love with it right away. We were like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is like the most fun uh, game. Uh, and so, like, we would try and let, you know, it's like we would call Nintendo all the time. We had you know direct connection to, to Nintendo. But again, just like my earlier story. They were still that kind of like we're we're only talking to magazines really. We don't really talk to websites. Websites mm-hmm. aren't a thing. Um, but but we we still kind of like said, hey, we're having a great time with this game. When is it coming out for the you know for in North America? And like um, though they would never go on the record, they cer- I, they certainly alluded to the fact that they were very uncomfortable with the idea of a game where Mario is beating up on Yoshi or mm-hmm. Donkey Kong or whatever. And they're like, I don't think those are going to fly in the U.S. Maybe it's a <laughs> cultural thing. Uh, we're still considering it, but you know, uh, you know, don't don't hold your breath. Um, and then, uh, and then we got word, I think, and I could be I could be incorrect here, but we also had um, uh, Brady Games kind of also like they did like strategy guides, and we kind of even though it was it's a it's it's it doesn't matter now, but we were doing uh, me my uh, me uh, Per Schneider. Uh, at Cast Messina, uh, I can't remember other other editors, but we would do strategy guides for Brady games under um, no pen name, no no. We would not be credited at all because it was considered a conflict of interest, right? We're yep. we're we're using company equipment. We're you know like we're maybe doing it on company time, but you know we would do guides for Brady without our names on it, and they would con- they contact us as hey, looks like Nintendo is going to be bringing it to the U.S. because uh, we just got the official. Um, the official, uh, what do you call it? The the license. Yep. So that they can do it because like before then, Brady was just like the an unofficial, you know, like perfect dark guide, and it would mm-hmm. be like all this crappy art, and uh, them uh, the, them getting the, the official license. This was their first licensed guide, so they, that means they get the they get the artwork and they can get information from Nintendo. Um, and so we're like, oh, awesome! And then that I actually was the one that that said, okay, I'll totally do the guide. I have time to do it. Um, and so I did the the strategy guide for. Uh, Super Smash Brothers uh, for Brady, um, and uh, I got I flown up to to Nintendo and and saw the version in development that was um, further along than what we were playing, you know, with the uh, the Japanese version. So mm-hmm. like the the, you, the scores were in Japanese on on the Japanese version, obviously, and so they were adding the English names for the levels and the and the scores and stuff like that. But it was still in flux, so like I couldn't say, oh, this is how much this you know this. This attack gets you to this point. It's blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, for the most part, I got the the guide 
pretty on point with with one exception of of Jigglypuff having her sleep move. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and uh, you know, I, in the guide, I'm like, what's the point of the sleep move? And so like I you know, I was like, I try to do everything with a sleep move, but it was just like I just put you to sleep. Don't do it. And and <laughs> Nintendo was like, you know, they were cool with everything that I was writing. And so it went in print with like, oh, the sleep move, yeah, don't don't do it. It's it's crap. Uh, but then like in in and this is just kind of straying the story. But then when the GameCube version came out and and uh, Fran Mirabella had just started uh, when we were playing the GameCube game, he played Jigglypuff and did the sleep move, which totally knocked me the hell out of the ring. Yeah. The first move, I'm like, what was that? And he's like, oh, that was in the N64 game too. And I'm like, oh crap. And so <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, and I think someone like recently pulled that like a scan of that page from my book mm-hmm. and it's like oh man nintendo doesn't know what they're talking about or brady or something and and people like started tweeting at me it's like because <laughs> they they heard they had the story on a on a on a, a nintendo voice chat where yeah. i wrote the book and so they kind of pointed to me it's like i was and i take full responsibility right <laughs> but nintendo didn't really help out there it's like they they looked at my text and said everything was cool so that's funny but uh but n64 game uh I guess we influenced it coming out. I hope. Yeah. Um, but I can't say for sure that we were we were the sole responsibility. But like, yeah, our our coverage probably kind of pushed them over the edge because like we, they were reading our features and you know like hey like we were starting to do little snippets of video and, um, and I think that kind of like said okay we'll we'll bring it to the U.S. and see what happens. That's cool. So uh, <clears throat> what was like. What was one of your highlights, I guess, or some of the highlights from your time at IGN? The highlights? Yeah. Um, probably the, 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 the biggest highlight um, uh, is being turned into a meme. Yeah. Uh, the, re- the Reaction Guys meme is amazing. And, yeah. and it, it's like the, I mean, it's like the most flattering thing that's ever happened, honestly. It's like, you know, like the, the I mean, uh, so like for people that don't really know what that is, um, it's the two the two two photos side by side. One of like four guys looking really bored, four guys looking really excited, and then whatever they do to to why are they excited or why are they bored? And that was a meme that kind of like took off more in Japan than here, but it's still a thing on the internet. And I think that's amazing. Um, I love seeing it. Every I mean, it still happens. I mean, like whenever there's like on Twitter and someone does the the, the reaction guys meme and it gets like thousands of retweets. That's <laughs> I, I find that really amazing. And so that's well, that's it's funny. My, it's funny how relevant that I, one has really, stayed. It's always been relevant. <laughs> yeah, it's someone actually pointed out to me. It's like the um, it's the old school version of the current the the, the Drake reaction. Yep. Uh, so like you know, it's like I don't like this thing, but I like this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the Drake. Uh, meme but no like yeah this was the before like years 10 years before about uh, 10 I, I i don't know timing anymore but yeah that's like it can't that we did that meme in 2000 i think or we it was never intended as a meme in the, in the first place it was mm-hmm. uh it was just a photo that someone snapped of us at the nintendo press conference and that became the the board photo that was the what the, the it, people use that as the Oh, do you remember Pac-Man Versus? The announcement for Pac-Man Versus at, at the Nintendo press conference. Here's that photo of four guys looking really bored, mm-hmm. and that was actually that got really popular on the on the message boards, uh, at least on the IGN message boards. People kept bringing that up. Uh, you know, it was on NeoGAF, and they kept they kept bringing up that photo uh, for a year. And so <laughs> we were like, we need to stage a photo. We, we found out about Twilight Princess for coming out for the, the GameCube mm-hmm. um, a day before. Um, they were going to announce it on stage at, at E3, so we need to kind of tease something. We need to let let the, our message boards know that there's going to be something tomorrow. You should be really excited. And so we we looked at our, the old photo of us being bored, and so we we were we were at E3, and so we went outside of our war room and and staged the photo of us looking really excited. Someone and, and someone took the photo. In fact, the same person that took the photo um, originally took the, took the new photo too. So everyone was involved. <laughs> And 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 we we did a really excited put. We did a bunch of them actually. There was a, it, it, I think someone Perry even has a few of them in, um, on his Twitter of of like alternate versions of our excited photo. Yep. But yeah, the the one that we posted is the one that got picked up as the meme. So yeah, we posted that really excited. It's like something's happening tomorrow, and just that and that photo, and then people just took those photos side by side, and and then just it just went wild. It just it just took off on the internet, and so that was kind of like one of the. The early internet memes, and and I'm super proud of being part of that, and and still proud of it. So that's I say that's highlight number one. 
That's uh, awesome. for me. Um, highlight number two is um, just being known as the the handheld guy, right? I mean, mm-hmm. um, when I you know worked at IGN, I I, I wore many hats. Um, I you know I worked on I started there on Saturn. Like I was hired to you know do coverage for the Sega Saturn, and like almost like six months later, they're like, oh. Sega's kind of killing the the Saturn, and so there's not much interest there, and there's not much traffic, so we need to move you somewhere else. And so I moved over to uh, Next Generation Online, and I did that for about three or four months. And that was really boring because it was just you know writing press releases. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went over to Ultra Game Players, and there was a lot more personality there. Um, and then um, after that kind of folded, I went over to uh, I, uh, the PC uh, a channel on IGN, uh, which I didn't enjoy very much. I didn't enjoy working with the, the, the person that was running that. Um, and so I was like, can I do something else? And they put me on PlayStation. But around that time, uh, me doing the PlayStation stuff, the we got the Game Boy Color in, mm-hmm. and Pokemon was popular, but the Game Boy Color was coming out, or it was out, and then um, playing some of the games, and in the Neo Geo Pocket Color was coming out. Was coming out. Uh, Wonder Swan was just out. Um, and it's like, why aren't we writing about these things? And we kind of are. Like, Wonder Swan was being written on the, the PlayStation channel, and uh, I think Neo Geo Pocket was kind of written on the Dreamcast channel, but uh, the, the only reason why that was doing, being done is because there was some sort of connection. Uh, there was, like, a cable you could buy for the Neo Geo Pocket, and you can connect it to the Dreamcast. Um, but, uh, but there wasn't a, a dedicated space for handheld gaming. And then so uh, myself and Per Schneider... Um, basically decided, hey, we should just do some reviews, put them in the system so that when uh, the the new IGN is launched, we, we were doing a redesign in, in the meantime, that we will actually have a place for these. So we'll call it we'll call it uh, handheldsigen.com and we changed it to pocket.ign.com. Um, and then when it went live, uh, Pear was like, why don't you just do this full time? Like we'll take you off of we'll take you off of the PlayStation. We'll hire someone else, but you just do like Game Boy stuff. Uh, and 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 cover that cover that industry and um, because I was pretty much the only one doing it on the internet. I mean, with exception, um, it was kind of like a a, a great place to uh, to meet developers who just basically were releasing games and not getting any sort of like attention. So you know, I would I would you know contact developers like, oh, you're working on this game, really cool. Um, that's kind of how I met uh, 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 Matt Boson over mm-hmm. at uh, Way Forward because they had a, a game that came out called extreme sports uh, with a really unique like kind of anime style and uh, um, I you know I got in touch with uh, Matt Boson who is the art director on that and I think the game designer mm-hmm. and uh, and that's how we kind of met Mark Boson the editor uh, and that's how we hired him is because like one day Mark Boson came over and was like yeah my brother worked on the games you like and I'm like oh you're pretty <laughs> cool you like games and so like you know when when we had an opportunity to hire a new editor and 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 Mark uh, you know I threw his hat in the ring. I'm like, I think he's the best of the bunch, and so like we hired him. Um, but yeah, so like, but but yeah, back to working on on handheld stuff. So like, uh, you know, like Game Boy Color, and then Game Boy Advance, and Nintendo DS. Uh, we, you know, with with the PlayStation Portable uh, mixed in, but uh, because there was so much coming out for Game Boy Advance, mm-hmm. I was like, I just don't have time to, to. I mean, as much as like the game, the PlayStation Portable PSP um, looks amazing, but I. Like I, I need to focus on on the Nintendo stuff. So um, uh, that was given to the PlayStation guys to cover. And I mean, I, I made the right choice because like I, I understood the the handheld market that you know like as cool as the PlayStation Portable is, you know like the the it's not really what the the handheld handhelds need to be yeah. at the time. Like it was like they need to be simple. They need to be uh, uh, cheap. Um, and like the PlayStation Portable was just like, oh, it's this really amazing system. It can do everything, and the games are like console prices, but not quite as good as the console versions. Mm-hmm. And so, like you know, it's like people are like, well, if I'm gonna spend forty dollars for a game, I'm gonna buy the console version, and play it on my big screen. Whereas like the the handheld stuff was like, oh, you know, this is made specifically for the Game Boy Advance. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can buy this one, but you can also buy the console version because they're completely different. Um, so yeah, so but. Uh, but that's kind of my other highlight is is being known as like the handheld guy and making all these relationships um, that that continue to this day. Um, you know, like I I have a bunch of friendships simply because I was covering their game back when it came out on 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 the Game Boy. That's awesome. Yeah. So, 
what are your thoughts? I guess, like, stop talking about like the the handheld stuff. What are what do you think of the Switch? Like, what was your initial thoughts on the Switch? Oh, I, I love the Switch. I, it's it's my my go to console now um, for anything that that's like indie mm -hmm. uh, or or even like kind of like I said my uh, you know earlier on I said you know my kind of games are the 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 lesser scope games that are you know like you know you jump in jump out uh, they're and and like the Switch is great on those kind of games right yeah. it's like you know it's not a it's not a powerhouse system and so like as, as long as you go in getting the switch knowing that it's not as powerful as the playstation 4 xbox one you're golden right and like right. a lot of times the uh, you know indies out there they don't have the budgets to make these big giant scope games that take advantage of the hardware um and so you know that that their their uh most common denominator is going to be the switch and so they're going to make the game that's going to work it's going to be beautiful on the switch um, and so that's kind of where I want it because it's so versatile, right? I mean, you can play it on the big screen. It looks great. You can pop it off and, and take it and play it on the couch while you're watching TV, and it looks great. And you, you don't lose anything. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of the Switch. And, like, even before the, the Switch came out and the Wii, w the Wii U was um, floundering. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the Wii I like the Wii U. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of it. Um, I'm, I'm sad to see that it didn't get picked up, but I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not oblivious to why it didn't didn't do well, mm -hmm. um, but I knew that with the Wii U. So the Wii U had the gamepad, right? And I'm like, the gamepad needs to be connected to the the system wirelessly, so like things are being beamed to the to the the gamepad, and the game the games look pretty good on that that screen. And I'm like, whatever Nintendo's next system is, it's going to be the opposite. It's going to be it's going to take this idea of the gamepad, and it's going to do it in reverse instead of Instead of a console that's beaming to this dummy terminal that, that the gamepad is, it's going to be everything is in the gamepad, and it's just going to beam to the uh, to the TV through some dummy like like a like an Apple TV kind of docking thing. Yep. And that was partially right. I mean, they got rid of the they got rid of the idea of two, dual screen gaming, mm -hmm. so it doesn't actually do any sort of like beaming to the television, but you certainly dock it to. To nothing, right? It, yep. It's just a it's just a dock, and you play it on the big screen television. So, so I kind of called it, but I'm not gonna say like I knew it exactly. <laughs> but um, I was I was pretty close, and I was proud of that. Um, and I really like the idea of the switch, and it's very smartly designed. Mm -hmm. uh, just with the idea of the detachable controllers, and then you can make them the, that one controller. Um, but I mean, there there are some flaws. Like my my controller is still kind of. I have giant meaty hands, yeah. and the and it covers the wireless transmission. So like I can't do the thing that it need, that that you, you know is supposed to do really well, which is take those controllers off and bring them to your couch and then play yep. because like it just the the left controller just does not work for me. And I've swapped out the controllers. Like I've actually gotten the I I don't know if they they quietly updated them again, but I certainly upgraded my Joy Cons when they said or when people were saying oh no the, that problem's gone mm -hmm. i still have that problem so i much I, I play all my games now with the the, the pro controller and i have no yep. problems so i love the switch i think it's great and um and i think we're at a point now where i'm happily buying all my games digitally because i can pretty much assume that whatever the next console is going to be it's going to be fully backward compatible yeah um that i can just move all my games to the next system and not worry about it yeah, and it's nice that Nintendo finally adopted the the cloud, like being able to like once you buy that game, you have it now. Like yeah. it's attached to your con or to your account. So that's really yeah, nice. Yeah. Well that's the thing, it's like they 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 were kind of figuring it out in the early days, like where mm -hmm. you know, how do you do digital purchases? And they kind of started that with the Wii. Um and, but they it was mount it was it was it was connected to the system itself, not to an account. Yep. So, and then I think it got a little better with Wii U and 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 well, on, on DSI, with they they did some sort of download thing, but it, that was also doing the same thing as the Wii. But yeah, so then then when the, when the 3DS and the 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 Wii U came out, that's when they they started attaching them to to accounts. Mm -hmm. But it still wasn't quite there. And then, <laughs> but yeah, I think they really kind of they got it with the Switch. And uh, and I actually just learned this, uh, early, you know, uh, probably about a couple months ago that uh, you can actually have you can purchase a game, but you can also play it on a different system if you log in as a secondary account. 
Mm-hmm. I think I think I haven't tried it yet, but if if that's the case, then Nintendo understands it now. Yeah, like that so, was that's the one thing that that, that I don't that I, you couldn't do is you buy a game and it's locked to that system. Yep. And then you and the only way to get it off that system to another system is to do, do a whole the system migration. Yeah. So the cool thing, like, so what you're talking about, um, me and my friend, we both have each other's accounts on each other's switches, and yeah. if you've bought in the game digitally you can download the game so like tony my friend i have his account and you can go into the eShop under his account and go to like my purchases and download that game and then start it and then if you just put it into like airplane mode because like if the the primary system turns on yeah it'll block you out but yeah you have to it does a check it's it's doing some sort of like you know like oh did you buy this thing yep and is it being played somewhere else if not then okay cool and so like yeah i i can see that yeah people are gaming that system but it's nintendo's been the most protective of the like the digital purchases and so like it's great to see that they're finally kind of opening up just a little bit even though uh people are starting to figure it out and, and and seeing how they can game it but but no i'm 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 very confident that you know, like my purchases will be like whatever the next Switch is going to be, or whatever the next Nintendo system is going to be. Uh, it'll be a uh, upscaled version of of what the the Switch is currently. Yeah, and I, I I feel confident that my purchases will carry over. And if they don't, well, that system is pretty portable, mm-hmm. and I have a lot of games on that thing, so I'm not really worried about it. So I guess that's my my, my next question. Since we're on the topic of the Switch, is do you think? the switch is almost like they'll have the mentality that they did with the ds where you went from the ds to the dsi to 3ds like um i guess when i look at the switch i feel like they really nailed it with the switch and um they've really recaptured what nintendo was before like the wii u so do you think that they will carry on with like the idea of the switch where they're having their handheld and consoles like instead of having two separate like portable and home like just keep it like together like the switch well that's the thing right so that there were two different markets nintendo was catering to Mm -hmm. uh, but they were never like they were never equally as strong so like you know it's like when the you know the gamecube was out the game boy advance was doing better and then like you know then the wii the wii came out it wasn't doing as good as it was just kind of this weird like this weird focusing it's like yes there were two teams there were teams dedicated to both at mm-hmm. the same time but it was clear that you know the a teams were, were either working on the console version when it was doing well or the the, the handheld when it was doing well um but it was a weird seesawing um the the switch kind of says you know it's both so you know when the when the 3ds runs its course mm-hmm. um I, i'm amazed at how long it's yeah. run its, its course <laughs> um it's i i would say the 3ds uh, if if I was looking at every game system that was ever has ever been released, you know, just like all things being equal, right? Mm-hmm. The 3DS is is my favorite system of all time. Definitely. Um, just just simply because of the things it can do, the things it did. Um, the th- I, I I love the stereoscopic 3D, and they did a lot of, a lot of good things with that. I mean, a lot of people called it gimmicks, but honestly, it actually opened up a lot of ideas. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, and I appreciate it when, when, when people use those ideas, otherwise, yeah, sure. I mean, but I mean like a driving game plays better when you can actually get some depth to it. So, yep. you know, I, I appreciate that. Um, but like, you know, like street pass is, is a great mm-hmm. example of a, of, of a game, game friendly, uh, tool, um, that, that was just, it, it really did a great job on the 3DS and it's like, it's a shame that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. See, that's um, what, I was surprised they didn't carry that forward on the switch considering it's portable. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not surprised because considering how long the switch lasts on battery, yeah. uh, yeah, that, that, the, the idea of, uh, street pass would just destroy its, its battery life. Yeah. And so I, I guarantee you it was, it was just a choice. It was like, we can't do this. It's just because like if people pulls it, pull their switch out of their bag, it's going to be dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, that happened with the 3ds. It's like, you know, like you can, the thing will last, like if you had street pass running on the DS, it lasted, it still lasted like weeks, like mm-hmm. probably two weeks. You played, you played street pass on, on Nintendogs. And you close the thing, and it's like you could have you could, that system would still last like two weeks. You open it up, and Nintendo is still there in bark mode, but uh, but you know like it, it it's still it's playable because it was just such an energy efficient thing. Mm-hmm. But on the the 3ds, 
uh, you know, the system was a lot higher processing and it's you doing a lot more wireless and, and it's, it's sniffing out multiple games. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the thing lasted maybe three days, three or four days on sleep mode, uh, when, when it's in street pass. And so that, that, that's, that's the unfortunate thing because I had, I had a bunch of friends. I'm like, that had a 3DS and I'm like, well, why don't I see you in street pass? And he's like, oh, I turned that off. It's yeah. like I, I turned it off because it, it's sucking the battery out, and I'm like, but I there's lots of cool, I I can't get your village or your house in in Animal Crossing if you don't <laughs> if you don't do it. Um, so it's a great idea, but yeah, on Switch, forget yeah. about it. People people would not have that turned on. Uh, they would they would get it right away. It's like if I, they're going to pull out their system and it's dead, they're like, oh well, Street Pass is gone. So I I you know like. Uh, I, I understand. I wish it was there still, but I understand. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah. So the 3ds uh, was it, you know it's, it's going to run its course, and then finally, the, the Nintendo can focus on one system, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's a benefit because you know developers, third party developers, don't have to don't have to guess what yeah. the system what the system they need to make on. They can just make it for that once one one console. And um, and I think that's a great thing. Uh, you know, as, as as much as I love the 3DS, yes, I mean it came out what in 2011. So I mean mm -hmm. the last of what uh, you know, was it 2011 or 2012? But it, it lasted almost eight eight years, and so that's an amazing time for uh, for any sort of uh, game system. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 had its had its day and it's done. Um, and so now the switch is it switches is there for the console players, and it's good there for the for the handheld gamers, and I think it's good for the developers. Because I just need to focus on one. Yeah. So, <clears throat> my next question. <coughs> excuse me. No um, the podcast. So, it started <laughs> as Week in Review, correct? Yep. yep. And that was with uh, Cass Messina? Uh, yeah. So, <coughs> pardon me. So, uh, the po podcasting started uh, kind of as a thing like i guess like ign you know like saw that people were starting to do podcasts and so they're like well we need to start doing that too um unfortunately around the time uh matt casmacina and mark boson um trying to think who else that's it mark yeah matt casmacina and boson they were down in la in the la office mm -hmm. i was up in san francisco and they would just do it um and it's like so like I would find out that you know they would post a podcast. I'm like, well, what? huh? It's like yeah, it's like well, I mean, it, 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 but there's nothing I can do, right? So I'm not gonna fly down to LA just to record for a half hour or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so then we we figured out a way to do it. So like to to have some sort of remote thing. And in the early days, you can probably totally hear what we're trying to do. And it was just like I had a conference call, a conference calling phone, mm -hmm. like a you know I would turn it on speakerphone so that I could we could talk to each other. And then I would record on my Macintosh, my my voice, uh, while they're recording their voices, and I would just send the package to actually, no, I would be the one that, they would send the package up to me, mm -hmm. because it's, it's all this like extra work. I was like, I don't wanna do that extra work, so <laughs> I will do it. And so like, yeah, so I, and then I would, I would stitch it together. Um, and it, and it, it, it worked, um, you know, like, I mean, we're doing this podcast and we're probably having the same, same issues, but we're not, we're not doing the, the, because we didn't have a, a great streaming technology at the time. It was just mm -hmm. like, we're recording it. But you know we're using a phone because the streaming technology kind of sucked. Yeah. But we're using yeah you know, like for our podcast we're in remote areas, but we're using streaming technology that you're recording my stuff, and that's a lot easier. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but then um, I think because we were talking more about more Nintendo, like more, even more like Nintendo DS stuff mm -hmm. than than Wii stuff, we had to change the name, and so I think someone on the message board suggested uh, Nintendo voice chat because it was ironic. Yep. Uh, because Nintendo doesn't have voice chat. <laughs> <laughs> or at the time, it didn't have voice chat. So uh, we thought that was a great name. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I became the host simply because it was easier for me to throw questions out and then talk. And, uh, um, and then, yeah, so then eventually um, they moved up or left and I still just took over the podcasting. Mm -hmm. um, not my training, not my, um, not the reason why I got into video games, but I certainly tried to make it work. And hopefully, I did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So I actually prefer being more a participant than a 
than the host. Yeah, I, I you know it's, it's really difficult for me to drive when you got crazy people like Scott Bromley yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to one up you every single like second. So um, very difficult. But I mean, it was fun. But uh, I yeah, like I said, I, I prefer being the participant. So like when I uh, I was invited on on Nintendo Voice Chat podcast uh, back in October because I did the the review for uh, Starlink mm-hmm. uh, for for all consoles. But yeah, they they brought me on um, kind of throwback and and I think a lot of people um, liked it. So it was fun. Yeah, definitely. So do you uh, do you so do you mainly just. Uh... Do you ever do like? Do you do many podcasts anymore? Like, I, I well, I'm doing yours, but well. uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> um, the. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I do podcasts when I get invited. So uh, no, I, I don't do many podcasts anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I've kind of lost my relevance since I've left the public face. Yeah, um, which is fine. Um, I'm not. I'm not much of a you know a influencer. I'm, I don't go on YouTube and 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 you know scream really loud the f bomb. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I sound like an old guy, but I mean, it's totally true. It's like I, you know, that's not something I I got into the the enthusiast games press thing anyway. It's just like mm-hmm. I I liked writing about games. I like ch- chatting about games, but I'm not an on camera personality. So yeah, um, I'm not I'm not in the public face. And plus, that's just the way the the industry has kind of moved now. It's all YouTube. It's all. Yeah. It's all streaming, and while you know, like I got out, um, I, I I recently earlier this year started doing streaming, um, slowly but surely. <clears throat> Pardon me. So like, yeah, I have a Twitch stream, uh, but um, I've kind of fell out of it just because I've got other things on a personal level mm-hmm. that I'm working on. Um, but you know, I get on every once in a while, so it's and, you know my 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 viewership is really really low. Um, so I'm not going to be the next influencer doing doing Twitch streaming, but um, I tend to. Kind of gravitate towards the new Nintendo releases, or uh, um, you know, the old you know retro games, and I've got all sorts of setup here mm-hmm. uh, where I, I can I can do my old Wii games, I can do Game Boy Advance. I I, um, I actually just uh, got one of my Atari Lynxes all modified, so I can stream that too. Really? Which is awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, so yeah. I mean, I don't know how many people want to actually watch uh, me play Atari Lynx games, but <laughs> I've got the ability. I can totally do it. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I I mean, like I said, if, if, if people are listening and they want to invite me on a podcast, I'll totally consider it. So because um, I like I said, I enjoy talking. But the problem is, like, the more podcasts I do, the more I'm t- chatting about the same exact thing. Yeah, and, I, and I'm like one of those people. that's like, oh, I gotta re- I gotta repeat myself. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I appreciate it because like not every podcast is the same audience. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I totally go on podcasts. That's awesome. So how about after IGN? Like after uh, IGN, I can't remember where you went. I guess originally. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was uh, around. It was 2011, I believe. 2010 or 11. When did Donkey Kong Country Returns come out? That was my last review. 2011. Uh, okay, I think so. So yeah, so I basically like I hit. Yeah, no, it must have been 2010 because I, I always say I worked there for oh, 13 years. Oh, it was because I remember yeah. Audrey and what you call it. Um, I can't remember his name. They were talking. It was George? It was, yeah, Rich, when the, the 3DS was coming out. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So the 3DS came out in 2011. Got yep. it, yes. <clears throat> so um, I was basically like, you know, I hit hit my, my where I'm going to be able to go at IGN, and it was time for me to leave. And so I didn't have anything really lined up. But uh, I was like, where can I go? And so I left. And uh, in the meantime, I was doing some freelance to kind of keep the bills paid. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, there was a magazine that uh, was, it was basically Best Buy's gaming magazine it was, um, that they were working on. Mm-hmm. Um, I did the entire, I did two months of the 3DS launch. And that was awesome. I was, yeah. I was, I was like, you know, it sucked that I was leaving around the, that left IGN around the time the 3DS was coming out. But it was... Uh, it was great that I could still do it just on a magazine instead of IGN. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, basically, that's kind of where I, I uh, hooked up with um, Sega because they, they basically did a. Uh, um, I, I was going from developer to developer playing the games for the magazine, and I was at Sega, and they were, they basically said, "Hey, we've got a, a position that is pretty cool for you if you you're interested." Um, and it was basically uh, they needed a kind of a. Uh, 
a person that sat in the middle of um, working with uh, Gearbox and 20th Century Fox mm -hmm. uh, on a, on the the game Aliens Colonial Marines, and so it was kind of like this kind of developer licensor relations guy in the marketing team that you know that worked with develop you know the development side uh, of for Aliens Colonial Marines. Now, like I, it was it's a cursed project it, when I when I got there. Like that, that that project had started and stopped, I think, multiple times. And uh, without getting too thick in the weeds, uh, I knew uh, as the games were, was was being developed that it was not going to score well. It wasn't going to do well. Um, <clears throat> but I was there for two and a half years, um, you know. And then when the game came out, uh, it didn't well do well. I mean, I totally called it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, and so, but Sega at the time was just having problems, and uh, and it was like, and it was two thousand thirteen. Uh, that they had a huge layoff, probably half the staff, and I was among them, and uh, and so I left. I saw the writing on the wall when I, you know, like I was there. I was like, oh geez, mm -hmm. yeah, I know this game's not going to do well, and you know they're going to have to find some way of cutting the costs and all that stuff. And so I knew I was kind of on the way out. Uh, while I was looking for things uh, uh, while I was there, but uh, when I when I left, I immediately, not immediately, probably a couple months, took me a couple months to find something, but I landed at EA. Mm -hmm. uh, to work on uh, the editorial for um, the Origin uh, digital download platform, so it's their version of Steam. Yep. So it's where you would go to buy, uh, you know, Battlefield and SimCity and The Sims and all that stuff. They weren't on Steam, so they had their own thing. They had their own thing, mm -hmm. and so I, I managed the editorial because they they had a, a change in voice and they needed someone to kind of manage the change in voice and tone and. Uh, so yeah, I did that for a year, and then uh, they they hired me on contract. So they they didn't they didn't hire me back. Uh, uh, they they you know they, they you know, the, the contracts last a year, mm -hmm. and so after that I was like, okay, now what? And uh, uh, eventually I found myself at at eBay of all places, and I'm like, really? well, this isn't video games, <laughs> uh, but they want me for my writing. Uh, you know, like they need they need someone for writing, and I went okay, and so I worked there for a year. Um and did it did you know like I, I liked working there and in fact in fact like it became about video games because we were doing some really cool thing it's like e eBay is where people sell their games right and yep. it's like so it, let's let's convince people to to sell their games on eBay instead of going to GameStop and mm -hmm. and trading them in for for peanuts yeah and so like we were working on a, a way to do that um, but as we were working on that uh, Apple came calling. And uh, and so like they, they needed someone on the editorial team for their app store for games, where wouldn't you know it, Matt Casmasina, Mark Bozon worked, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, yes, of course I want to work there. Uh, so um, I worked there for two and a half years, and uh, um, and I'm not there anymore, but uh, um, I'm I'm now doing writing at at, at Wells Fargo. But oh, uh, really? I might find my way back in video games. You never know. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, we're coming up on the hour mark, but I have, I guess the, this, I want to get your take on this. Have you seen the Sega, or not Sega, but the Sonic, the, like the movie, the live action movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was your initial thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I kind of, it was, it's interesting because like, I'm just like, when we, you know, because like, it's not just, we didn't just see it in the trailer. We saw the leaks, mm -hmm. the, the, all the posters that, and they, where they were showing the silhouette. Yep. And then we're, I think someone leaked the silhouette, and then they they leaked like him sitting on the the Golden Gate Bridge. And you just saw the legs, mm -hmm. and we're and I, and and like I'm looking at this going, oh my god, what happened? Because <laughs> uh, like I I you know I worked at Sega, and I know how protective they are of the Sonic brand, mm -hmm. and I'm like, how did what what had happened where the the movie studio had convinced sonic team and sega that this is the right way of going yeah. and i'm like I'm, i don't know what happened there i couldn't even tell you like it, it's so, someone somewhere did their job and and convinced sega that this is the right way of doing it um because like i was there around the time that sonic boom was being developed mm -hmm. and so like i saw the you know the 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 character profiles on the wall and i'm like oh my god the i mean they look cool now people are really they, they've embraced it but back then i'm like oh my god what's what you know knuckles being twice as tall as sonic and and uh you know sonic wearing a scarf and i'm like mm -hmm. if they had a problem with sonic's color of shoe and eye color you know the eye color in the dreamcast version 
I, I think the, the 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 people that are fans of Sonic are gonna have a problem with you know how Sonic Boom was going, and it's like if that happened, <laughs> like I'm, I I can't imagine what's going on at Sega when they they released that trailer. Oh, uh, and, but to the point where I mean, so so my personal my yeah my, my personal feeling is it's not good. It yeah. is not a good look. Um, it's weird. <laughs> It's, it's it's odd. Like, it's yeah, exactly. It's, it's like off-putting. the nose just doesn't look right, and it's, and like they don't even they don't really the only thing they've embraced as 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 a Sonic char- characteristic is his blue color. That's it. Mm-hmm. He doesn't wear gloves. Uh, his sneakers are off. Uh, his <laughs> eyes aren't connected. It's like it's a completely different take on on Sonic the Hedgehog. And uh, while I don't want to like rag on. Uh, you know the character guy that they, 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 they designed it. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, he worked on it for probably you know months and months and months to make it look like that. I don't think he's a bad artist. I just don't think it came out as good as it could have been. Yeah. Um, and I think it. Yeah. I think I. I totally think it's a mistake. And it's cool to hear that they can. They're going to go back and tweak it. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, it's going to be seamless in tweaking. <laughs> like I mean, if it's just going to be like. Taking that character mesh and, and tweaking it to stretch and, eye, and change the eyes and stuff like that, while retaining all the the animation, mm-hmm. uh, I think that'll be you know that'll help. But it, we might not be seeing that movie until uh, 2020. Yeah, because it's gonna. It, I don't think anyone wants the the crunch time to happen in movies just to so they can hit the Christmas time. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what did you think about uh, Detective Pikachu? Speaking of live action. I was thinking about seeing it uh, tonight, but I'm gonna pass and, and I'll, I'll see it this weekend. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm 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 uh, excited. Uh, I've been always been excited for the, the since the trailer, the first trailer. I'm like, oh, this looks like it could be the the first actually good video game to movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, every you know, I can't think of another like a, a movie, a video game movie that's been good. Like they've been okay, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a, like Mortal Kombat is okay. T- Tomb Raider is okay. Uh, Prince of Persia: Sands of Time is okay. Um, and then there's terrible ones, you know, Street Fighter <laughs> and, and Double Dragon and all that stuff, and Mario, Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. But uh, this could be the the first legitimately good video game movie, um, and I'm excited for that because it looks like it knows what it is, mm-hmm. and it understands what the franchise is. So. Um, I'm excited to see it. I haven't been looking at the reviews. I don't know what the Rotten Tomato score is, but um, I'll be seeing it with uh, fresh eyes. That'll be good. I uh, I wish there was... There's like So where I live, there's no movie theaters. Like The one movie theater that was close was like 40 miles away. Oof. And that one's closing. <laughs> so like <laughs> That's a shame. The, the closest movie theater is an hour away from here. Well, but uh, So I'll probably... I don't know. I might. So I work out of town. So Just take I'm your hoping, bike. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that it's playing in the movie theater in the town that I work in. But uh, no, I thought that one looked cool. Like it was um, like at first I was like, oh, live action. It's going to be weird. But I actually like the way the characters turned out in that one. Yeah, the, um, the, 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 the skins, but... the, yeah, the, <laughs> the 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 scales and skin and fur and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's unique because like you know they've always they, you know they, when, when Pokemon Go came out there was a trailer where you had you know the the, the humans together with Pokemon, but it was mm-hmm. in that kind of sleek and stylized. And I, you know it, I would be okay with that if that was the way the movie was, but it looks like they t- they took a risk mm-hmm. and they they added a bit more realism to the the look of the classic characters. And while you know the first time you see it, you're like, "Huh, interesting." I mean, Pikachu is going to look great because he's got mm-hmm. he's got fur. But then when you see like Charizard with scales and stuff like yeah. that, it's uh, you know, it's a little off putting. But then you kind of like see what how you know the the world around him, and it's like, "No, this kind of works." Yeah. And uh, and so I'm really excited to see you know the the entire world and in, in the full movie in context. Yeah, and I think Ryan Reynolds was that was epic that they got him to do Pikachu. Like, <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, an interesting choice, especially coming off of Deadpool, right? Yeah. It's like, like, I uh, really hope that he brings, it seems like he's bringing some of that attitude from Deadpool into it. Yeah. I think that'll be really good. That'll be, it'll add. That's probably the why they got him, honestly. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, they can, he can, you know, do his, uh, his Deadpool thing, but just without the, the F-bombs or whatever. Yep. So, no, I'm, I'm really excited for it. That'll be cool. So, we are at that hour, Mark. Um, do you want to throw out where people can find you on social media <laughs> well, and all that? Sure, uh, you can uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Cranky Craig, uh, or 
you can go on, you can follow me at Twitch TV um, High Score C R A. Cool. Um, that I call that, that. That's my account name there because um, when I play arcade games, my initials are C R A. So High Score C R A is my Twitch name. Um, I stream probably about two or three times a week. That's uh, awesome. And, and I didn't know about that. Me. So I'll be, I'll definitely check you out there. That's cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. So everybody, uh, that's the episode for this. Well, I usually do it twice a month, but um, <laughs> thank you, Craig, for doing this. It's awesome. It's like talking to a rock star for me because, I mean, I've known you for so long, and it's it's just incredible to get to talk to you. It's oh, almost it's great like, to be remembered. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's like talking to a movie star. So <laughs> <laughs> No but, way. Uh, but, but thank, thank you, you again. Um, it was awesome to get to hear from you, and... Uh, I miss I miss the the Craig Harris days of NBC. It was the the golden era for me. So um, it just means that I'm getting old too. So <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll but, hear me on NBC again. Who knows? That'd be awesome. Um, yeah. So thank you, and uh, we will hopefully maybe talk to you again on here. Cool. Great awesome. talking to you, man. Yep. Thank you. So that was Cranky Craig. I hope you guys liked it. I had a blast talking to him. It was like talking to a superstar of the gaming world for me. I hope you guys liked that as much as I did. Um, if you want to be on the show, tweet at me at Nintendshell and just say, hey, I'd like to be on the show. Um, anybody's welcome. Like I said, I, you know, the people that I'm reaching out to, I, I'm, I'm trying to get interesting people, but the show is for you. If you want to be on the show, like I said, reach out to me, leave a comment down below. If there's somebody you want me to try and get on the show, leave a comment um, or tweet at me or whatever. Make sure you leave a thumbs up on this video and subscribe to the channel to get more episodes of this. Um, the support's awesome, and like I said, you know, leave a comment if there's somebody that you want me to get. Thank you again for the support, and like I said, make sure you leave a thumbs up on this video, and subscribe to the channel, and until next time, I will catch you later.